All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Ways and Means Committee meeting of Tuesday, November 17th, 2020. I call this meeting to order at 5.30 p.m. This meeting is being recorded by the Ways and Means Committee and GCTV. If anyone else present is doing the same, please notify me at this time. Seeing none, Councillor Bottomley, would you please do the roll call? Yes, uh, I'm Councillor Bottomley, I'm present. Uh, Councillor DeSorger. I don't believe she signed on yet. Uh, I'll come back. Uh, Councillor Elmer. Here. Councillor Forgy. Here. Chairperson Wheeler. I'm here. Great. All right. Um, well, we do have a quorum. So we'll start off with the approval of minutes. Um, let's see, on page three. Um, do I hear a motion to approve the minutes of uh, September 15th and October 20th, 2020? So move, Forgy. Moved by Councillor Forgy, seconded by Councillor Elmer with his hand up, yes. which I will accept. Um, any discussion on the minutes? They look good to me. Um, so hearing none, all those in favor um, say aye, or raise your, raise your hand, I guess. We all have our video on. I think I can see everyone. That's four hands, so uh, the minutes pass unanimously. Um, we have no public hearings. So uh, we will go right into the FY21 tax classification on page seven of your packet. I move that the city council adopt a minimum residential factor of one, resulting in an equal tax rate for all classes of property for the fiscal year 2021. Is there a second? Second, 4G. Thank you. Um, is acting chief assessor Kimberly Mew and uh, uh, welcome Kim would you like to give a brief introduction before we get started here sure hi everybody I'm Kim Mew I am the assistant assessor here in the city of Greenfield um, and I am here tonight to just go over briefly um, the classification um, as well as I have gotten a few questions from one of our counselors um, that I would also like to briefly just touch on as well. Great, thank you. And I will now note for the record that Councillor DeSorger has signed on and is present. Um, all right, does anyone ha on the committee have any questions that they'd like to start off on? I know many of you actually, well, yeah, many of you, it's your first First time doing this cla tax classification. We do this every year um, and we do need to do it on schedule. Um, if you don't have any questions uh, yet, uh, maybe Kim, you could um, answer the ones that came through email that you that you said. Sure. You, yeah. Sure. Um, so these are not 100% based on the classification hearing. So I just wanted to briefly answer these and then, um, you know, if there's further questions, uh, providing time, um, we can sort of go from there. Um, so the first question was um, a question about the TIF status of 10, I'm sorry, 201 Munson Street. Um, the question said, in 2017, the value of the property was decreased by 50%. It went from 1.488800 to 780,400. Um, and again, just for for you, those of you who might be taking notes, that number again was 1, comma 800, um, going down to 708, comma 400. Um, the other, and then the question is, what made up their uh, 1.557025 private investment? Uh, this person said that they see that there's a $95,000 $95, um, amount of improvements and what year are they in now in the TIF? 
Um, so lots of questions there. Um, so currently, 201 Munson Street has a signed TIF with the city. It was a 10-year TIF, and it's currently in its fourth year. Um, so at that moment, it means that the fiscal year 2021 taxes are getting a 70% reduction on the fair market value for this particular property based on this TIF agreement. Um, and this this agreement, just for those of you who don't know, an, a TIF is an agreement with the city um, to, you know, it's, it's a building that's uh, bringing jobs to Greenfield. And so you make arrangements with the city um, and you get a small discount um, on your taxes. Generally, it's between seven and 10 years. Um, so those of you who just don't know what a TIF is, that's basically in a nutshell. Um, so the, the 201 Munson Street is in its fourth year of the 10-year TIF at 70% of the fair, fair uh, market value. And um, just so you're aware, the following years will go down from their 10% each year. So next year it'll be at 60%, then 50, 40, so on and so forth. Um, so if the applicant is not in compliance with the TIF agreement, the assessor's office will be notified and we will not um, give them their TIF for that particular fiscal year. Um, this has not happened yet to my knowledge when I've been in this position. Um, so I would assume that they're able to uh, fix whatever is wrong and we can continue giving them that TIF in the future. But that's something that um, we'll come across if that happens. So um, as of right now, uh, this TIF is in compliance as I am aware of. Um, so they will be continuing to get the 70% this year and then continuing down with the reduction from there. Um, moving on to the next question, it was um, that... Um, can I interrupt? Sure. Yeah. Um, can you just explain what business they're in, what jobs they brought to the town and why they got the TIF? Um, so I don't have the TIF directly right in front of me right now, so I can give you a brief um, overview of what I can remember. Um, so this was, um, this TIF was Decker Machine Works. Um, so I can imagine there's a pretty significant amount of jobs that they've brought in um, being a machine company. Um, I apologize, I don't have that in front of me. I wasn't prepared to, to go too much into detail with that tonight. Um, but it's certainly something that I can get for you if that is um, something of interest. Um, and th thank you, Ms. Mew, and just for counselors' um, benefit, Generally, TIF questions should be uh, directed at the Economic Development Committee, um, and those discussions should happen there. But thank you for um, answering that question, Kim. No problem. And I'll let you continue. Also, just so everybody's aware, too, I believe there is a TIF committee meeting coming up. So if someone is interested in going, um, I can get that information for you as well. Um, if that's something you're interested in. Um, so the next question, I apologize, I skipped the question as to um, if the applicant didn't meet the full requirements, what happens? And that's where I was going with the, uh, they wouldn't get their exemption for the year or their percentage off for the year. Um, so the next question is that, um, it says we are actually talking about classification. 46% of the town is resident, is uh, rental units. This, biz this is a business for many. Um, this person sees that two and three families along with multifamilies are listed in as residential. Um, and the question is, do any municipalities count them as commercial properties? Can we or should we? Um, and, and the answer to that is we cannot. Um, it, that's a state requirement that we have to look at anything that is a residence as a residential property. Um, so basically, a, a residential unit um, is constructed of a place where someone can live, and that can be... Um, as few as one unit, as many as a large apartment building. Um, I understand the position where this looks like it's, you know, it is someone's income, but it's a residence. It's where someone lives. So they would always receive um, the residential classification. Um, and we have to look at them that way because that's the way the state mandates. That's that's just the way they, unless they change something, unfortunately, because it's a residence, it just gets looked at as a residential property. Um, and then the last question that I got from email was, um, 
what is the latest date the classification needs to be determined by? Can this wait until December? Um, there is no specific date that this has to be done by. So a city or town can push it back as far as they want. They can do it as early as they want, as long as the state approves their information. Um, but you run a, a very large risk by pushing it back too far of not getting your tax bills out on time, which will make a significant impact on your city because or your town because if you don't have your income on time then you could get into some serious trouble for us specifically if our bills go out late that means our first real estate and personal property payments do not have to be into the office until may 1st so if everybody in the city decided they wanted to wait and pay then they can they're not late and we don't have any income except for maybe excise parking tickets and the little things like that. That's so right. we really need to push to get our, our taxes done on time. Um, and in the past, I think some of you probably know, um, between all the things that were going on with computer situations, um, the split tax rate conversation, um, the collector and I, Kelly and I both uh, worked Christmas Eve a few years in a row to get this done for you. So um, we really don't want to do that again. <laughs> so, um, you know, understandably, if things don't go exactly the way they're supposed to go, that's okay. We still have a little bit of time, but, um, you know, getting them done as soon as possible is ideal so we can have extra time to test the systems and just make sure that everything is running smoothly. Very good. Thank you. Your concerns are duly noted. <laughs> um, do uh, counselors have questions or comments, discussion of any kind? Actually, I, I have a question. I don't know if it's appropriate for this particular what, uh, time, but I have a question about assessing. Sure. Uh, because we had, in one of the last meetings, you went through um, the complex set of factors that go into assessing property values. Mm -hmm. And still, I'm concerned about some commercial properties um, that, based on those criteria, that I still am not. I think we talked a lot in generalities, mm -hmm. and I know I have a specific property, and even if it's not tonight, but like uh, 347 Wells Street is one example that see they just. I feel like I'm missing something. It seems kind of egregious that a. Uh, a property that's over three acres big is assessed at 143,000 yet a couple of years ago was 337,000. So I'm just concerned that as we determine whether we're gonna to try to do a split tax rate, it's kind of relevant if these commercial properties are actually going down in value mm -hmm. by quite a bit. So I think this is a very relevant question. Um, we can briefly touch on that property just because that's the specific one that you're talking about, but it goes in hand in hand with the commercial, uh, with the um, split tax rate conversation. Um, this particular property, I obviously know very well because we've been talking about it lately. Um, and something that uh, I believe we touched at in the Board of Assessors meeting um, on this specific property is that you, you look at the land as well as the buildings that are on it. In this case, unfortunately, since the buildings are in such terrible shape, they're dragging down the value of the property. So back a couple of years ago when it was up in the $300,000 range, those buildings might have been in better shape. Um, without looking exactly at the record card, I don't, you know, I don't want to give you exact, um, you know, this is what happened um, because I don't, you know, I don't want to have any facts wrong but um for this specific one i think there's something to that nature going on there as well um but also um along the business side of things um this particular property seems as though that it has a couple of businesses potentially running on it um the trick with that one is there's a lot of vehicles and vehicles you can't tax in personal property tax unless they don't have um, license uh, registration. So if, if it's a farm vehicle that literally never leaves the farm, like it's a tractor or something, you can tax them on that in personal property. But if it has a license plate, then they're already getting a tax. So personal property is in lieu of an excise tax bill and vice versa. It, um, uh, excise taxes in lieu of personal property. And that goes for all of us as well with just our regular vehicles. Um, so what I mean by going hand in hand um, with the split tax rate is speaking about properties um, 
that are commercial in our city. Um, I have no no issue whatsoever with, if we decide that we want to do a split tax rate. That's completely up to you guys. I'm happy to do it either way. This year, though, I'm a little concerned because uh, we haven't had a chance to really sit down and talk about the facts and the, you know, what happens if and the scenarios of, you know, what if we do this right here and this right here. So there's a lot of work left to be done if that's what we decide to do. And that's I'm worried that that's going to push our tax rate back. Uh, but but mostly I'm worried about our, our commercial um, properties because we have a very fragile commercial um industry in greenfield at the moment um and so i just worry that if we do do a split tax rate um you know being that the residential properties in greenfield make up almost 76 percent of our city and so that leaves just under 26 percent uh 25 percent of um the rest of the, the property is being commercial properties. And you think, okay, well, that doesn't sound so, so bad, right? But look at our downtown. There's a lot of vacancies. And what I worry that would happen is, yes, those we say, okay, 25% of our town is, is commercial, but they're classified as commercial. Are there actually businesses in those places? So that's what worries me a little bit right now about the split tax rate. So this property and that question, John, definitely goes in hand in hand together. Um, you know, I certainly would be happy to um, sit down and talk with you either one on one or or through email or you know in a different meeting more in detail. I think about that situation, uh, but I think that sort of answers your question as well as um, ties it into the classification as well. Great, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I will jump in here basically to agree with what what Miss Muse said. Um, there's two parts to it. Uh, first, I I believe um, generally um, any robust conversation around adopting a split tax rate um, has to begin with a a split tax rate committee that's formed months in advance of the tax classification hearing, um, and obviously that was not done this year. Um, and so what I've what I've said every year is that if a split tax rate want to seriously look at, then it needs to be studied. Um, probably we have to start in the summer. Um, appropriate for Greenfield at this time that generally a city that would adopt the split tax rate because quite frankly there's there's some there's some room there and there's some negotiating power so if we were in a place where business was booming and we could afford to lose a few um commercial businesses um to kind of give a give a break to residences uh then then i could certainly support it but um i don't think that's the environment we're in i don't think we want to hit any businesses any harder than they're already hit um being that we're in a pandemic so um i support a, uh, going with uh, Sether's recommendation of uh adopting a, a single rate any other uh discussion or questions from counselors Councillor elmer <laughs> yeah this may not be appropriate for this committee but uh, kim if i could ask I, I remember the last time we spoke to you i asked you if you had some sense of what of how much money we were leaving on the table by not aggressively uh, revaluating prop property. Uh, I, I, I don't think you ever got back to me with that. And it, I, in retrospect, I realize it's a very hard figure to come up with. Um, but I do, I, I, from hearing what Councillor Desoria has, has, has found, I, I do get the sense that there is money on the table that we're not collecting uh, by by properly or fairly valuing uh, the properties, and I, I guess I have some questions about how that is done. Uh, I understand in the in the past, and maybe this is before you came on board, that we had a company that not only kept the database but also went and looked at properties. Um, Patriot something. Patriot um, properties, yes. Yeah. 
Do, do we have something like that now? Is there a company that's looking at property or is that totally fallen on your department's shoulders? So we still have Patriot Properties. They are actually our database, but that is the only thing that they do currently. Um, they do do that other, other things for other towns where they do the inspections and such, but here in Greenfield, um, they just are the keeper of our data. Um, and we have RRG. And I think that I certainly I do not want to discount anyone's work from, per, from um, Patriot Properties, but I really really strongly believe that we honestly have a phenomenal group of people working with us. Um, not only have they been a massive help to me as I learned through this job, but they've been a significant um, asset in so many other directions. And one of those things is our values. Um, I believe that their inspections are the most honest, truthful, um, the experience that they've brought here with their inspections is is great that you know the many many years that they have done these inspections um you know so i i'm not trying to just boost them but i just you know i'm trying to build your confidence that we really have a great thing right now and so if if things were done differently in the past um the way they're being done right now i think is a strong confident um change may i follow up yes um, so, so give me a sense of, can you give me a sense of how many, um, we have like 6,000 properties, how many properties a, a quarter or a year are being uh, inspected by these folks? Um, so I can't give you an exact number at the moment, uh, but I would, you know, by state requirements and law, we have to look at a quarter of the town every year. Um, so, you know, I would say we're, tr we're trying to do that. It's, it's fantastic if we can get uh, you know, more than that. That's the goal. Uh, this year obviously has been a little bit more difficult because of the situation that we're in. But, you know, I would say in a normal circumstance, that should be the average is, you know, to try to look at a quarter, um, you know, and right now, especially with um, the request and the money set aside for the commercial and industrial reval, um, that's a big part of what they're doing as well. And we've looked at a lot of properties and um, are continuing to do studies on those. One last one. If, if um, what resources would you need uh, to do, um, I mean, you, you're, the state mandates that you do a quarter of the property every year. I get the feeling you're not quite sure that you're doing that. And, it, and I'm asking what, what would you need from us to do that, to meet that requirement? Um, it's not necessarily that I don't think that we're doing that. I just don't want to give you a number and not have it be exactly the amount of properties that we're looking at. Um, meaning, you know, we have over 6,000 parcels. So, and I don't know that exact number off the top of my head. So I, I hate to just give you a number and have it be totally bogus. So that's all I mean by that. Um, but I would say we're absolutely meeting our state requirements. And if we don't, uh, especially next year, we have our reval, the state will come in and we will get in quite significant trouble. Um, and if the state doesn't think that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, they'll take over and bill us and they don't care what our budgets are and what money we have. Mm -hmm. So we have to follow. We can't not follow them. So I apologize for not being able to give you exact numbers, but that's, um, you know, basically in a nutshell, we have to follow that. Thank you. Thanks. Um, question from Councillor Forgy. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, my question is following up on Phil's, which is um, twofold. Number one, Patriot Properties maintains our database. What does that mean? So maintain is, is a word that you can take in many directions there. What I mean is, I maintain the database by, you know, being in there every day. They hold the data. So that is the software system that we use. That I, so I guess maintain was probably the wrong word, so I apologize for that. No, software it, so this now here's my question. Is the and so you are actually saying that the software system that holds our data that holds our data is not compatible with whatever RRG is putting out at this point? No. Why Why two separate? That's what I want to know. Why are there two separate companies involved in this? So, our, so, okay, Patriot is involved 
in many communities, but not all. Um, Patriot Properties, their main source, right, like what they do every single day is their software. They used to do a lot more inspections and um, sort of in a, in a sense they would be there right side by side with the assessor during the whole year and especially during the end um, for classification and setting the tax rate and all that stuff and they've sort of pulled back from that so i don't know i can't really speak for them as to whether or not that's just something they don't want to do anymore or what's going on there but um the difference between them and rrg is rrg doesn't have software they are they're actual people that come out they'll do the inspections they'll work side by side with you they have someone that specializes in um, as I mentioned before, I think um, they have specific people that specialize in chapter. They have specific people that specialize in TIFs, solar, um, appellate tax board cases, so on and so forth. I could, you know, keep going. Um, so the difference basically is just one is specifically for software, um, and one is is actual people that are working with us side by side. And can you tell me from a budgetary point of view how much is that? How much is is how what? much is the paying for the services provided by both Patriot and RRG? Um, I Jerry? I don't have those numbers directly in front of me right now. Um, okay. If we're looking to have Patriot Properties do the work that RRG does, I don't know. That's something we would have to actually reach out to them for because I don't know one if they will still do something like that for a community at our size a lot of the communities that they do are little tiny towns yeah. um and what that cost would be because that's probably different than what it was way back when um i have another follow-up if i could um is there is there a scenario um in the future that would enable all of this um uh to be produced by Greenfield so that the software system itself is something that Greenfield installs and owns and okay. Nope, that's, if we do something like that, it's gonna cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars. No, okay. Then if we need help with something, there's no one, nowhere to go. So I, I highly doubt that we would do anything like that. Okay, and to just extend your, uh, extend it one more time and I thank everybody's patience here. Um, including yours. So my, um, again, what would, what, what budgetary pieces would have to be in place in order for us to become more aggressive in addressing some of the issues that have been brought forward? In other words, are you, would more personnel in your office be helpful? Sorry, Ooh. that's at my house. Okay. Okay. Fly, smoke alarm. <laughs> I think it's the oven. I'll be right back. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> All right. We're going yeah. to talk, talk amongst ourselves for. And you were worried about my dog. <laughs> At least my I'll, house. I'll be right home. back, too. <laughs> okay. So. Um, huh? All right. Well, it's a little too early for a recess, but if anyone <laughs> needs to take a minute. Well, we got the fire chief on the line, so yeah, there's right. nothing to worry about, right? Yes, we'll be right there. Well, except she lives in Turner's Falls. But okay. <laughs> back, <and> back. <laughs> so we have really, really sensitive uh, system, and my husband was cooking pizza for my son. So <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Glad, <laughs> glad you're okay. It's better than naked people in your Zoom. This is right. <laughs> I, I, I heard it and thought it was a feedback. <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay, so, so the yeah. question, what, what, what would be, what would enable your office to be more aggressive um, in terms of trying to put, uh, you know, trying to you up to, okay, so how do we get on top of this? How do we crack this all? And my question would be, what would your budgetary needs or personnel needs be? Oh, oh Jesus Christ. <laughs> 
<laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> do what you have That's to do. That's smoke detector. <laughs> Um, all right. <laughs> I hope GCTV has got this. It's a real action shot. <laughs> Otis, I'm going to have another question when she comes back. Yeah. Okay. Um, we'll, uh, we'll let her answer the one that's hanging if she can remember what it is. And if then I'll, it, I'll call on you. And ever get it out of her mouth with that <laughs> alarm going off. Okay. Yes, I'm right. really sorry. Please, don't, don't, don't worry about it. Um, you know, catch your breath. Um, <laughs> Stop my heart. <laughs> yeah. I'm just, I'm just glad it's only pizza. I hope you didn't yeah. burn it. I hear the uh, beating, so it must be nothing. It's just a sensitive system. <laughs> All right. Well, that so, means means it's effective. Um, <laughs> well, I'm going to use my privilege as chair to rephrase the question slightly okay. and ask you to answer: Do you identify areas of improvement, mm -hmm. and if so, um, do you see ways in which appropriation, further appropriations to your office, could make improvements? Um. So I think that. Um, at the moment, we have a pretty good grasp on the commercial industrial. Um, and I know I keep going back to the reval, but we have a pretty good grasp on where we're going with that, what we're doing. Um, it is something that's going to take a little bit of time because of the, um, the, there's a lot of parts to it in order to get it um, where exactly where we want it to be. Um, and if we just go ahead and slam dunk with an update, um, it's going along with the split tax rate. Like we may lose some people and we don't want to do that. Um, we care very much about the residents as well. So I just want to make that clear that it's not just about the commercial properties. Um, so I think, you know, handle wise, I think we have a good idea of where we're going. Um, aggressively uh, um, looking at some of these things that have been brought to our attention. Um, a lot of them we have actually already either begun looking at or looked at and fixed, or um, so on and so forth. Um, so I think, you know, at the moment, we're actually really in a good place. Um, I think some of the concerns that have been brought to my office's attention actually are something that the assessor's office doesn't have jurisdiction to, um, um, to look at, to address. Um, and, and in those cases, in, in many cases, I've actually said, you know, it's an enforcement issue, it's a licensing issue, it's whatever the case is, so that the, the person who's requesting can, um, you know, reach out to those people if that's where they want to go with that. Um, you know, I'm not going to say that having another person in the office would be a horrible thing, because obviously everybody would like to have, you know, more people. Um, but depending on a lot of pieces we're getting uh, the assessor's office is getting a lot of work coming up with um, pace with the community preservation act um with all these tiffs that are happening um it's just adding a little bit there's you know there's a couple of other things that are just happening that um are giving us more to do so either you know maybe start out first with having two full-time people instead of one um certainly I recommend that we keep RRG around for a little while. Um, I understand that people want to have um, people employed by the city instead of a company employed by the city, but I just can't stress enough how much RRG is bringing to our city and how much they are helping us just by having all these resources. They're also, you know, you look at it as, oh, but we're paying them this much money. But if we didn't have them, we would have to be paying for an attorney if we have any ATB cases to, um, you know, help us with those cases. We, you know, so on and so forth. They won't go too far into detail, but I just think that having them stick around for a while is really important. Um, you know, and then again, in a perfect world, of course, at least starting out with two full-time people or almost full-time people, you know, just more, a little bit more than what I have. Um, obviously, I don't want to burden people with having a massive budget um, and having to uprate, you know, the tax rate and all that. But, you know, 
start out with just a little and see where it goes. And if it, if it's helping add a little bit more, you know, just do a little at a time, I think. Um, but as for um, just a little security, you know, I think we really are headed in the right direction. Um, and I think we're moving forward pretty quickly. Thank you. Um, I, uh, let's see. Okay, we've got a few people, um, but I'm going to let uh, recognize Director Gilman here in case there was something uh, that you yeah, wanted. Yeah, I just wanted Kim, if she could, talk a little bit about the levy limit, which we are capped at each year, and the impact of more value or more valuation. Um, in turn, because I've heard leaving money on the table. I think it's more what you're talking about is a more equitable, equitable distribution, um, not necessarily money on the table. Um, but I don't, Kim, do you have any insight on that? Yeah, um, well, I can ask you guys if you could, if you look at page, oh boy, I mixed up all my pages. I think it's page two, three. It starts at the top with terminology in your classification package. Um, if you go down to the where it says fiscal year 2021 levy limit and the amount to be raised, which is in bold, something that um, just just very briefly to look at, um, you'll see your levy ceiling and your levy limit. And there's a little bit of a difference there. Um, and, and we do this because we don't want to tax at the absolute like top of the moon because that hurts people, we know that. And if we don't absolutely have to have that money, although it's nice to have what you know, what, what you and I would call a savings account, so if you have to fall back on, it's not really something that we want to practice. Um, so also looking at all these numbers right here on this page, um, think about if your values on your property are increasing, assuming everything works the way it's supposed to, your tax rate's going to come down. Mm -hmm. So the more and more we spend time working on our values and with our commercial industrial, finishing up that reval, updating our cost tables so that, you know, our commercial properties are, you know, higher in value. Um, the more we focus on, um, you know, sales of properties, if a property, if, if a group it, for example, if capes are all of a sudden all selling for between three and four hundred thousand dollars, and we have them assessed at you know two hundred, we've got some work to do. So we need to focus on that. Um, and so along the lines of what Liz is talking about, if we can focus on all that stuff and get all those values up to the good in good shape, our tax rate is going to come down um, because these numbers are going to adjust. We need to make the same amount of money, but we're doing it in a different in a different way rather than taxing your dollars as you know we're we're collecting it because your your assessment is higher thanks i'm gonna recognize director gilman and then we're, i'm gonna try to move on because we do need to uh, cover up other topics and uh liz you're on mute i guess oh wait sorry try to keep it on mute um so just because your tax rate comes, the tax rate comes down, when your value comes up, your tax bill does not change, <laughs> folks. <laughs> so it's it's a reciprocal relationship. Right. So that's where I was going with all all of that, and and having Kim explain about that because um, why it's good to have our overall value up higher in terms of EQV and and debt limit and all that um your your levy limit is driven by the levy from the prior year right and not the value <laughs> so um uh again your tax bill isn't going to change your rate mate your value goes up your rate goes down and this i'm saying even across the board it doesn't happen evenly but your tax rate goes down, the value goes up, your tax bill stays the same because you're still raising the same amount of money for your budget. Right. So I know it's a, another conversation, but I, I don't want us to get lost in the, um, 
idea that we're leaving a lot of money on the table. Yeah, thank you, Director Gilman. Uh -huh. That's noted. <laughs> <laughs> very much noted. Um, I don't want us to get lost in the weeds here. I do think it's wishful thinking to believe that assessing will um, change the general picture of the the taxation in Greenfield. I think um, the the perception of a that there's a tax rate that people can't pay has to do with incomes and it has to do with the actual condition of the actual properties in the city. But I'm glad that we are giving it the attention it deserves. And I'll take a question or two more if we have them. Um, but I would like to get to a vote on this because we do have a number of things to address tonight. So any more questions? Councillor Forgey. It's just informational. Um, who are the members of the um, EDC? Um, off of the top of my head, at least two of them are on this committee. Okay, that would be nice to know. <laughs> uh, I, I can answer. Yes, Councillor Elmer, please. If it's me, there's Councillor Disorder, there's uh, Tim Dolan, who's the chairman, uh, and the firemen, um, uh, Councillor Jarvis, Councillor Jarvis, I think okay. is that five. Oh, and then Hirschfeld. Yeah. Right. And Councillor Elmer, did you have a question? I, I just um, uh, is is Kim still here? Yes. Yeah, Kim. The last time uh, we talked about this. Uh, you, we, we had a little back and forth about, you know, someone said, well, you know, we can't, some people won't open their door for the inspector. Uh, and that we, and I said, well, you know, you could get a court order, but that wouldn't scale very well. But I would be very interested if you, if you guys started keeping a list of the properties that refuse entry to the assessors. Um, I'm not sure what we do with that, but uh, I would be very interested to know who's who's not cooperating. So just on a quick note, we do something sort of to that nature. Um, if we send out notification to do an inspection, for example, of a neighborhood, um, we will put a note in everyone's everyone in that neighborhood's um, we have an activity section on our record card. So when if you asked for someone's record card, you would see in the activity the recent um, work that we've done to their property. So an inspection, a permit visit, um, a field review, and so on and so forth. And it would say something like that in there. Um, generally, if we actually physically make a connection with someone and they're, they, they say to us, no, you can't come in, we will note that on the record. Um, I know what you're saying, though, as to pulling a report to look at those people. I don't know that I could do that based on using that. Um, but certainly something to actually think about. That might be an interesting um, study to do. Thank you. Answer to Sorger. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I totally agree with the people that have spoken. This is a year that we need, I, I feel that we need to keep at a single tax rate, with a factor of one for everyone, um, because um, our businesses are having a hard enough time um, one thing that I do think that um, in the town that I came from, when we needed to build new things in town, um, people, if, they, if people weren't letting people in, their assessment was raised if there had been other sales in the neighborhood. And then after that, if they had a problem with it, um, they could then file for an abatement, at which point you had to let someone in. So that would not be an excuse for not not raising assessments if they needed to be done in a certain area. And I do think that you're doing a good job, but that we do have some that need to be raised up. And by doing so, I think you have one of the most important jobs here in the city, which you're, you, you are trying to do a great job with that every single day. But I think that there are some that we need to get up a little higher because it's it's time to do that and it will help the whole the entire community but i do think that i'd go for this the uh, factor of one so i can just very quickly respond um thank you for your, your kind mm -hmm. comments um but also 
Uh, I'm not sure um, w- how we, the other town was was doing that, but we can't just bump people's values. Um, there has to be sort of some degree of a study to as to why we're doing that, because the state's going to go, well, what happened there? And we can't just say, oh, well, we wanted it to be higher um because they'll smack us on the hand (laughs) and i know that's not exactly what you were saying um but we you know with every type of property at the end of every year we do have to do a study of um we break it down using again um residents we will break it down of single family homes and then we'll break it down even farther to the type of home we break it down to the neighborhood um As you know, I'm getting a lot of public records requests, and so I'm seeing a lot of these record cards just coming through, um, you know, whether I'm printing them or whether I'm um, emailing them through the system to someone. And so I noticed some neighborhoods are higher than others. And so something that we can certainly look at, um, I, I, you know, greatly appreciate everyone's concern and want so badly to, um, you know, raise more money. And so I, you know, will do the best that I can to try to do that in a manner that the state won't be angry with us and in a matter of fair and equitable uh, everyone in the t- in the city. Thank you, Ms. Mew, and thank you for answering all the questions from the subcommittee. I, I doubt we'll have any more on the next of those two uh, orders, but you never know. Um, is there any discussion amongst the committee um, before we vote on this matter? Councillor Elmer? I just, the, the language of it, uh, that we're voting on no small commercial exemption. Uh, tell me what oh. that means. <laughs> um, I happily will, but I'm going to wait until we get to it. Um, okay. Oh, that's not what we're doing. Yeah. We're doing uh, doing them one at a time, and we're on uh, the top one on. I think it was page seven. Is that it? the minimum residential? Uh, yeah. The factor of one. And so this is just uh, cho- voting uh, finalizing a single tax rate. So, any more uh, discussion on the tax rate? All right. Uh, Seeing none, I'm going to take a uh, roll call vote. This is um, a yes vote would adopt a residential factor of one for an equal tax rate for all properties in fiscal year 2021. Uh, Council Bottomley, would you uh, do a roll call vote, please? Sure. Um, I will vote uh, yes. Uh, Councillor DeSorger? Yes. Councillor Almer? Yes. Councillor Forgy? Yes. Councillor Wheeler? And I vote yes. All right. Thank you, everyone. It passes unanimously. We have a single tax rate for FY 2021. I move that it be ordered that the City Council votes that no residential exemption be adopted for fiscal year 2021. Is there a second? So moved. Seconded by Councillor Forgy. Um, And we'll uh, have discussion on this now. I will start, if that's all right, by just noting that a residential exemption, um, essentially, uh, for anyone who doesn't know, exempts the first $100,000 of the home, I I believe was my understanding. We've looked into it um, casually in the past, and it's uh, it's really only adopted in communities that are either big cities, um, Boston, Cambridge, Somerville, or tend to have a lot of vacation homes. Um, so only, I believe, 18% of communities in Massachusetts have a residential exemption. Um, it is a progressive tax. It hits um, bigger houses hard and... Um, my understanding having looked into it is that it probably would hit uh, people who are maybe house house proud and cash poor, uh, of which we have, I think, many in Greenfield. It would hit, hit them pretty hard. So um, while I when I came on council, I kind of um, had some support for this. I have I've yet to see that it is necessary or the right thing for Greenfield. And um, I have the same opinion that I do of of a split tax rate, which would be that for uh, council to responsibly vote a residential exemption, it should appoint a um, a committee to study it a few months in advance. Um, But that's just my opinion. 
Um, so is there any uh, discussion or questions for anyone um, from finance or assessing? Councillor Elmer. Uh, I assume that if there was such an exemption and that the money would be made up by a higher yes. tax yes. On, the, on the bigger properties. Okay. Exactly. And that's why it's, it's a rather uh, large shift. And so um, while it would be nice to take some of the burden off the, the people with the smaller homes, um, it would hit, uh, hit the people with the bigger homes pretty hard. Um, let me just say, I, I'm not sure that's a bad idea, but I hear you that it would take, if we're going to do it, you got to do some planning and have a committee. Um, all right, let me think about that. Thanks. Anyone else? Can I just yes. give an example too, just for yeah. everyone? Um, recently at a class that I had gone to before COVID, um, someone was from the Cape and they were actually talking about this specific thing. And he said in his town, it was a very small town and I don't remember off the top of my head um, where it was. It was just before the Cape. Um, he said that he had a handful of people that actually lived there. Um, so they would get this residential exemption and then everyone else was second homes. So there's just a different direction to look at it as we, I think, have 99% um, full-time residents in, in Greenfield. So just don't want to hurt our residents any more than, um, you know, we have to. <laughs> Not that we want to, but we just don't, you know, we don't want to add any more burden to your pockets, especially this year. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And that, that lines up with my experience in, in the city as well, like in Boston where, you know, I, you might make $400,000 a year and actually have a hard time, you know, purchasing a residential property, you know, so they have the residential exemption to keep it from being a city where, only investors can own. Um, but I, I am also kind of, uh, you know, I, I do see the, where it's something that could be looked at. All right, any um, further discussion on that? So I just wanted to clarify. So a yes vote means no residential exemption. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the way the order is, is written. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying that one. <laughs> Okay, so seeing no further discussion, um, uh, all those in favor of no residential exemption, say aye. 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 There's five hands. That's uh, unanimous. There will be no residential exemption. I move that the city council votes that no small commercial exemption be adopted for uh, fiscal year 2021. I'll Is there a second? second? It. I'll second it. Councillor Forgey seconded. Discussion? This, this is similar to the residential exemption. Actually ap applies more to businesses, I believe, even. Councillor Elmer. Oh, you're muted. Where, it's not clear to me where these uh, uh, motions are coming from. Um, page seven in, no, in no, your I, packet, if I you have the newest packet. Oh, I, I see. I, I do have the packet. Sometimes they say they're coming from the mayor. Yes. Yes, yes. that's um, my question. These, these are um, made every year as part of the tax classification hearing coming from the, the assessor's office and the board of assessors. Okay. Thanks. If I may just quickly yes. explain sort of what this one is. Um, this one is sort of exactly the same as the residential, except that it is for commercial. So if we have a split tax rate, um, this kind of goes hand in hand with it. Because um, if you have a split tax rate, um, just looking at your main street, your downtown, um, a lot of the mom and pop places, um, just off the top of my head, um, the thrift shops, uh, Barney B's, uh, you know, at the nail places, things like that, they may fit into this category of being able to get an exemption of that. And so basically they would just pay um, the same tax rate as the residential properties. 
Um, so this is if we if we do decide to do a split tax rate, this would definitely be something that you want to look at at the same time, because um, if you're doing the split tax rate and you're going to allow this, you then need to do a totally different study on, OK, how many of those small mom and pop places will actually be paying the residential tax rate and how many are left? Is it worth doing the split tax rate? So just a thought um, just to sort of explain what that is as well. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that was a great, uh, great summary of that. You know, if uh, if we were so lucky as to have, you know, some huge employer come into the city that completely just changed the dynamic and we did adopt a, a split tax rate, then that would would probably be essential, I think, in order to exempt the, the mom and pops, like Kim said. But um, any other discussion or questions on this piece? Okay, seeing none, um, all those in favor of no small commercial exemption, uh, raise your hand. And that's uh, five hands, so it is unanimous. There is a uh, single tax rate with no residential exemption and no small commercial exemption. Uh, thank you, Kim. For coming tonight, I think I think you're off the hook unless I'm forgetting about something. Thank I think you for having me, and I apologize for giving you all heart failure and a show of leaving the door. <laughs> Not at all. That was the all right, most entertainment takeout, so we don't have to deal with that. <laughs> Very good. Don't worry about it. I like the entertainment. <laughs> all right, and thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank okay, you. so we're going to move now to page 13 in your packet. Do I have a volunteer to um, read this motion? A volunteer. Thank you. For, okay. Um, order number fiscal year 21-0229. The City Council, upon recommendation of Mayor Wiedergardner, an order reduce fiscal year 21 general operating budget appropriation ordered that to reduce the fiscal year 21 general fund operating budget appropriation of 53 million uh, 879,442,000 by the amount of $370,000 for a revised 21 fiscal year 21 operating budget total of 53,509.4, is that correct? No, it's comma, 442. Um, 53,109,442 is to be raised, um, I think that should be and appropriated, raised and appropriated and $400,000 transferred from parking meter receipts for fiscal year um, starting July 1, 2020 and ending June 30, 2021. The following accounts are to be reduced. 132 reserve fund, reserve fund $25,000. 155 technology MIS salary and wages 22 thousand one ninety seven energy expenditures twelve thousand two thirteen dispatch salaries and wages fifty thousand two two oh fire department salary and wages forty six thousand two two oh fire department expenditures fourteen four for a subtotal of let's see one oh three six hundred no Am I reading that? I hope so. Um, and then we have um, four departments, 441, no, 411, 422, 438, 425, public works, salaries. There's, uh, I'm a, okay. Um, public works expenditures, 16,600. 191 central services salaries and wages fourteen thousand one hundred dollars one ninety five one ninety one central services expenditures one thousand dollars one nine two central maintenance expenditures sixteen three hundred thousand 
491 cemetery expenditures, 13,500. 603 recreation salary and wages, 20,500. 912 workers' compensation insurance, workers' compensation insurance, 15,000. For a total of 370, $370,000. Total reduction. Thank you. There's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Second oh, Elmer. Seconded by Councillor Elmer. Um, all right. So I imagine there will be some discussion um, and some questions here. I know that at one point we had uh, the mayor on the line, and I can I believe we still do. Uh, we have Director Warner on the line. Um, you know, the, this is something that is necessary to do to, uh, to balance the budget. Um, and my question certainly is what are the effects on services? So I guess I will, um, start by addressing, uh, the mayor. Um, Mayor, could you, <laughs> and you can throw this question to a department head if you like, but could you begin um, by outlining your understanding of what the effect to services are um, and exactly how much grass will not be cut because of these, these cuts? Oh, you're on mute. I was going to say, once I unmute, I can. Um, I, I will let Marlo speak on that because he, he may have a better grasp on the day-to-day. -day. Um, you're right. We do have to do this. Um, I guess the, the way I look at it is we did not reduce staff at this point in time. These are people that... Um, in the salary piece, these are people that were not hired. So obviously they were put in the budget because we thought we would need them down the line. Um, and so therefore we, but we also knew the 2021 of all years was going to be pretty difficult. We assumed, I mean, we, we have to go on how we uh, look at the budget and what the impacts might be as we move along, and this has been a year of challenges, as everybody understands. So, um, in anticipation of that, we did ask the department where some of their new hires, their part-time people that they uh, bring on, and so forth and so on, if they could wait either till later in the year to hire them, or not hire them at all once we found out where we were with our budget and what we might need to cut to get it balanced. Um, then that would be that would be what we I would instruct them to do, and they did that. So the effect going forward, I guess, needs to be looked at both in a um, how shall I say it? A, a long-term and a short-term view. The short-term is now where we are. We need to do this. The long-term is what will happen further out. We still have numbers coming in. Liz can address this maybe a little better than I, that are, are, are showing some positive things in the community and on our <clears throat> budget side. But that doesn't mean we still don't have to make these cuts. So I like to think of it, uh, as we have truly, and I hope everyone understands this, um, one of the best DPW departments um, to, um, to a person in uh, Western Massachusetts and certainly in Franklin County, they are, they are top notch people. Um, sorry, we're losing one. Uh, but we'll fix that too. Uh, and um, so we're used in this used to this in this city of them being Johnny on the spot, doing everything every day. They do it at one hundred and five percent, whereas other towns not so much. So I feel like if the grass doesn't get they're going to get to it because that's what they do and they'll work with the staff that they have. 
I have every confidence in that. And Marlon and I have, have talked about that. Um, but if they get there a little bit later, or if the you know beacon field is a little shaggy around the earlobes, uh, that sort of thing, that's just the way it's going to be for a while. But they will get to it. So I feel like um, the impacts will be more of a um, of an image and uh, not so much an image thing. That's not correct. The impacts will be more that people will notice that things are happening a little slower. But I think by and large, people will not particularly notice at all. If we we have every and, and there may be ways that Marlo within his budget with you know, new new information comes in every day, uh, including savings in various line items and so forth. If there is a way within his budget that he can move some people around and hire later on, fine. We just wanted to be very cognizant of the fact that when you hire people, you're not just hiring them to pay them a wage, you're paying their salary, or pay them a salary or their wage, you're paying for their health care, their retirement, et cetera, et cetera. We don't want to take on that burden along with everything else. Now, part-time people are a little different, uh, unbenefited people. But we didn't want to take on the, uh, the burden of doing that in, say, July, August, and have to, have to let them go, which is also an expensive proposition, in um, now. <laughs> so I think the impacts, while they sound great, uh, in 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 uh, impact are not going to be noticed or be as um, bad as everybody might think. Now I will let certainly whenever you're ready, um, Marlo address that in a way that maybe he who has the day to day can enlighten you a little bit on. And then if if you want Liz to also discuss it that's fine but that's the way i have been thinking about it that's the way liz and i have been talking about it and as i say marlo marlo knows how to get you know 105 percent out of the people that he's um he's working with and they 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 do it because they they like their jobs and they love greenfield you're on mute <laughs> <laughs> Happens to all of us, doesn't it? Yes. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, we do have a question from Councilor Forgey, but I'm going to let us um, pursue this um, this piece first, and just basically um, uh, welcome Marla Warner, the director of the DPW, and um, Director Warner. Would you answer um, the question that, presuming these are positions that we will be able to hire for? um next year hoping uh crossing our fingers um what would be the short-term impacts to the department of these cuts sure thank you hi everyone um i i think the the mayor did a fine job of summarizing what we've been talking about um so you know it's the short-term impact and the long-term impact uh of these budget cuts that you know they're miles apart um is as silly as this may sound, COVID um, put us in this position, but COVID also allowed me to comb the budget and find some things that um, were helpful to the uh, the budget cuts that that didn't create any further layoffs or didn't create layoffs, I should say. So um, the short term impact, just to elaborate a little bit on on what the the mayor had said. Um, we don't know where COVID's going, where it's bringing us, what it's going to look like in the spring. And I think what it looks like in the spring is going to be the, the um, I, I think we're going to find out exactly what the impacts are. Now, when I say that, um, we will probably be getting some things a little slower. If everything's back to normal, you know, we prep tennis course, we prep the swimming area. Um, we clean up from winter and, and that's another key thing, you know, depending on the harsh winter, that also makes it dependent on how long it takes to uh, get through that process. 
Um, so I, I think, you know, we're, we're used to the exact dates and, and, and I think we've, we've done a fine job of hitting them dates year after year after year, June 1st, the clay tennis courts are usually done, so on and so forth. Um, we were a little slower this year only because of COVID and, and we were tending to many other things for the city, uh, through, through the COVID process. So, um, I, I think in short term, um, you know, anything can happen any given day in public works with emergencies, storms, et cetera. Um, but in, in the short term, I, I you know, I, I feel confident that we're going to be OK. Um, I think going into spring is going to be most important. Um, and I, I want to back the bus up to April or May. I think Liz and I were having these discussions back in April and May. We all were. Um, and I think Liz brought it to the council's attention. Um, right out of the gate, July 1st, I put um, not zero spending in place with all the departments, but um, basically anything outside of essential spending, you know, had to be approved through myself or the deputy director. So um, I think at the end of the day, uh, that was a good move. Um, we, you know, we, we got a lot accomplished in the DPW um, through this process. Um, 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 I'm very, uh, very proud of the crew and, and, and uh, everybody uh, really giving it their all. Um, so short term impacts, we get through, you know, June 30th, July 1, we're OK. I think the, the long term impacts are another whole discussion um, as, as I build the new budget coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, you know, the, the couple of positions in the summer help long term uh, certainly would uh, if you will, show its its impacts and slow to provide services going forward after July one. Um, I, I think there's there's no no one has a crystal ball, um, but we'll we'll continue to do what we do when we can. Um, but I would expect that in the come spring, you know, the grass is going to be a little higher. It's not going to be at an inch and a half at all times. Um, you know, we're going to have taller grass. We're, I'm, I'm sure we're going to get to the swimming area. Um, and I saved enough budget in the materials and whatnot to make sure that we had, um, if you will, the comfort foods that the community has come to come to expect to have, especially through COVID. Um, you know, ma mainly the swimming area, uh, the parks and playgrounds. Again, we may be a little slow to repairing some repair or making repairs there, or doing the wood chips to spread the wood chips to meet, you know, code. Um, I, I think the process slows down, um, which is a big change for me, I must say. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we'll, I, I think we're going to be okay. Like I said, no one has a crystal ball. But in a normal year, the short term impacts would be, uh, would, would be significant. Um, but being the situation we're in, I believe that short term uh, will be okay. But long term, I, I think it's most important that, that, uh, we can reinsert some of these things, especially the uh, salaries and wages and a few positions we, we may need going forward. But um, with that being said, um, I'll take any questions. Thank you, Director Warner. And yeah, hopefully we'll have a more robust discussion around the long-term piece during the budget process for FY22. Um, but uh, Councilor Forgey, did you want to ask your question now or or um, should we finish with uh, DPW line uh, first? Um, it's fine to continue with DPW. That makes okay. sense. Okay. Thank All you. All right. All right. Anyone, anyone with questions or comments about the DPW piece? Councilor Bottomley? Yeah, Director Warner, I was wondering if you could tell us how many summer positions are lost from this, if you've got an approximate. Okay, salaries and wages uh, is is two FTEs, full time employees, and the the summer help is two, uh, two two summer help, two temp help we call them. Um, one in the highway traffic division and one in the parks division, is how it works out in the account numbers. Okay, and, and just to to mayor the mayor's point, um, I, I don't want to go on and on, but. You know, we have a very large department. There's movement. There's bumping through the union uh, collective bargaining agreement. Um, sometimes people leave. Um, so when that happens, there's always a delay in bringing a new person aboard. So I wanted to point out that we're actually going through one of those processes now. Um, 
it, you, you can't always depend on that. You don't always lose an employee through the year, but when you do, you gain a little bit of salary, if, if I may put it that way. Uh, there's a delay depending on the buyout when the, when the employee leaves for, for you know, uh, benefits. Um, but if I can make up, and, and, and again, I make no promises here, we don't know what's gonna happen, but I may be able to make up the part the, the for help and, and do some transfers working with Liz uh, early spring so we can get on top of that and get the, the the summer help hired in when we need them to start. Uh, it's very difficult after July 1st. So I, I have I have contingency plans here. It's just a matter of how this plays out this winter and, and what it looks like coming into, say, February or March and, and, and see what we're looking at. Very good. Uh, Councilor Forgey, you have a question? Yes, I do. Um, so I've heard people this evening describe this as a short-term cut. Um, my question to you, um, Director Warner, is: Can um, would you need the, the 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 budget restored in the next fiscal year, particularly in light of the fact that DPW will be involved in the temporary? fire station building process where um, my understanding is that DPW will be doing a lot of infrastructure work for us? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so, you know, we're, we're dealing with uh, budget cuts here in the general operating budget. Um, as we all know, it's the general budget. I also have a water and sewer enterprise uh, budget that has its personnel. So um, it, it is a very interesting question, but it's there's an easy answer. Um, so we have not affected our water and sewer budgets and impacts on wages and salaries in water and sewer. And predominantly, a lot of that work, small amounts of it will come out of the general, the highway department. Uh, but for the most part, we're looking at the water and sewer Utility, utility crews, excuse me, in the yard doing that work. So um, it, it really, it really, the, the budget cuts are, are, are separate from the impact on us uh, helping the city out with the uh, temporary fire station. Thank you. You know, we, we still have other things we have to meet with the consent order. I've already reviewed all that. You know, we got to keep moving on other things. We have regulatory going on. Um, you know, we're already three quarters of the way in planning our, our work for all of next year, um, which we're way ahead of the game, only due to, you know, the circumstances we're under. So um, I, I hope that answers your question and I and I hope it answers many other other folks questions. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Any other uh, questions either for Director Warner or the mayor or Director Gilman? Councilor Bottomley? Uh, just one other question. I was wondering, is um, the deputy director position, has that been approved to be uh, hired? I, I was curious with the leading yes, of we, Paul Raskovitz. Yes, we, we've already gone through the process. Um, it, it has been advertised. Um, it's out there. We're already receiving resumes and applications. So um, it's going to be a process, I would say, probably um not filled till potentially uh the first week of january but it's a position in particular where we want to screen screen everything real well we want to go through the process and it's a little bit lengthier um, than other positions great thank you further questions or discussion councillor disorger are we, um, this would be for Director Gilman, are we anticipating any further cuts to the budget, to this year's budget? Yeah, just unmuting myself. <laughs> um, I, I, I am not. Um, we have, these cuts have been a result um, from the information sent of, um, state aid cuts, increase in state assessments, um, our, our, uh, we've, we're up to the last, we're on the Senate state aid, so there's only one more to go. Um, the last couple haven't varied a lot. Um, 
So I'm not anticipating further cuts. Um, we, um, when we get to the point of looking at the revenues, um, we did reduce many of the local receipt budgets for particular items, um, as it was very evident <laughs> that we needed to do so. Um, so I'm not anticipating more cuts. I feel the real challenge is going to be in 22 in crafting that budget. Um, we actually have done pretty well in managing local receipts as, as well as um, uh, submitting for our balance sheet. Um, so I, I feel Greenfield's in a pretty good shape for what I see in some other communities. Um, but again, as I state, the challenge is going to be the 22 budget. Thank you. The fun days ahead of us. <laughs> certainly do. Who wants to sign up to be on this committee again next year? <laughs> um, all right. Uh, <laughs> all right, Councillor Warner. <laughs> yeah, we need a Councillor Warner. <laughs> Not sure you that's allowed by charter. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I can't have another job with me. <laughs> <laughs> no, not allowed. Um, all right, any more discussion or questions on um, on any of these line items? Councillor Elmer? Oh, you're, you're on mute. I noticed that some of the money came out of dispatch and fire. Uh, can I take the fact that the, fire, the chief's not here to defend his department, that everything's okay? <laughs> well, the chief is here, so I think uh, we'll let him speak. If, is that, does that work for you, Councillor Elmer? Sure. Our chief is. Yeah, fire chief can speak to the fire department piece at least, not if not dispatch. Yeah, I'll just give you a quick overview. Um, um, we anticipated, or I anticipated, um, uh, when COVID started that this was probably going to be coming, and, and I'm actually relieved that this is not as big as as I originally w was uh, was thinking. Um, but with that said. Uh, just a quick overview of, of the reduction was on our department. We are not reducing any current manpower. Um, and so you will see no difference in the amount of people that respond on calls. Um, where we are reducing is uh, we had a clerical, part-time clerical that was going to assist our fire prevention officer uh, that's been budgeted the last couple of years. And because of reductions, it's it's uh, been removed. So uh, it's unfortunate that we uh, aren't going to be able to fill that again this year, but um, it's not, you know, the critical part is keeping the firefighters on the floor uh, and available for calls. The rest of it has, has come through line items such as EMS supplies and some other things that, you know, um, there's kind of a mixed blessing with, with, with the COVID uh, virus. The one thing is, is that it's causing the reductions. The other thing is, is that um, we've seen uh, an increase in, in um, transports with our ambulance, uh, not necessarily COVID, but, but in general, uh, an increase in, in transports. So our revenue is up with our ambulance. And so it's always been the goal that the ambulance service be self-sufficient uh, in regards to paying for its own equipment and, and everything that, that, that's needed for the ambulance. But there are still some EMS supplies and, and charges that go back to the regular fund because it's 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 regular department budget and so we're going to be able to shift a couple of those to the ambulance revenue uh and that's why one of the key items that you'll have in front of you is to vote to increase the ambulance revenue spending cap um uh and uh, uh that is going to be vital for us to be able to, to to make this work um the other item that we reduced is our overtime obviously overtime is um, I, Overtime's all over the place some years. Some years it's okay, and some years it's it's not. Last year, for example, we went way over on overtime. Uh, this year, because of COVID, um, we're seeing a lot more sick leave. Uh, 
necessary sick leave because if you if we have a firefighter that comes in with symptoms, we can't have them working until they get a retest, and so they're out. Um, uh, and we've had uh, occasions where we've had people isolated for 14 days, and and so we've seen an increase in that. So we're watching it closely, uh, and we're hoping to keep it all in balance. Um, but. Uh, you know, uh, nobody feels good about budget cuts, but we certainly uh, will do our part to get us through this crisis. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. Any follow-up questions for Chief Strand? All right, seeing none. Um, would um, either the mayor or Director Warner be able to just briefly, uh, sorry, not Director Warner, maybe Director Gilman, um, be able to speak to the dispatch. Um, I'm presuming that's a position or a couple of part-time positions that were not filled. Uh, is that correct? And is there any, um, you know, hit to that department? I might let Liz speak to that. I had a conversation quite some time ago with Chief, um, Peg about it and um, again while not uh, I don't I, I honestly don't remember the details and I think he actually spoke more to Liz at the end of the day about how to manage this and where to make the cuts and um, I think again his he was it, it's it's similar I believe to Marlowe's situation in that you know, it'll have some impact, but it won't be huge impact on him. Um, I don't recall if, I think it's a reduction in hours or something. So I, I'm going to see if Liz has any better information on it. But it was his suggestion. Let me put it that way. Okay, Good Chief, <laughs> you, have to, it, you have to cut your budget by X. What do you want to do? <laughs> yeah. So where do you want? I mean, that's the way I approach it uh, as much as as does uh, Director Gilman. Mm -hmm. We don't know. We don't know what the day to day is. We don't know what the potential. If I was just to arbitrarily say, you know, you know, get rid of a couple of your junior officers or something like that. Uh, that might obviously be the right, wrong, that would probably be the wrong thing to do. I'm not going to arbitrarily do that. I'm going to go to them and say, what will you do and how can you do it and how can it have the least impact on the city? And um, so I think that um, that the chief rose to that occasion and, and figured it out. Thank you, Mayor. So yeah, understanding that it did, you know, probably come from the chief, um, that we're just doing our due diligence to um, sure. know what these impacts are. So um, Director Gilman, do you have any insight into that? I do. Um, what the mayor said is correct, but there's also one other aspect in that they received a training grant that will cover some of the overtime. So they're shifting some overtime, which is helping out tremendously this year. So, Good. and also not filling something, but it, yeah. that's the main part. Good, thank you. Okay, so those we've covered the the bigger um, the bigger cuts, but any uh, any further uh, you know comments or questions or discussion from committee members? Council Bodley, uh, this is a. a I have a question. It's probably for either you or, or or Director Gilman, but is it possible for the council to transfer money, like say from our meetings and seminars budget, to a specific department, or would that have to go back into general fund? Because I think that's something we might be able to give up to help aid in these cuts. It's such an extraordinary time. Right. Um, the I'll, I'll start by trying to answer it. Um, the the training line item um, for counselors, which is, I want to say $6,000 um, and has almost certainly not been sent down this year, could, um, I do I do believe, you know, that the, I think you'd, you'd require a, an order probably from, um, you know, the mayor's office to do it. And it might be, late in the game uh, to try to to try to put that through. Um, but that's I guess that's my understanding. Um, I just like to add that 
that can be done at any time of the year to transfer from one department to another because you aren't changing the bottom line hmm. of the budget. Um, but it would take an order. So, you know, approximately two and a half months. But, you know, I, I think that Director Warner will keep an eye on things. And if he needs some more assistance, we'll, we'll look hard, hmm. you know, to, to transfer some funds to uh, back to DPW. I think it's worth considering, uh, yep. just because it's such extraordinary times. I don't. I, I don't think that. I don't. From my understanding, it's not a penny has been spent in that account yet. Uh, and, and for the cuts in the services of what the community is expecting, it sounds like that it's a relatively small amount, but it might yep. allow for a say a part time summer help uh, employee, which you know, at least for me, I think I'd rather have that go to the community than necessarily uh, something that we can't really attend anything because of COVID anyway. But I did think that's something that requires a motion from me or an order from the mayor. An yeah. order from the mayor. Okay. Um, so it would be two and a half, it's the soonest another two and a half months, you know. Um, but yeah. again, the summer help isn't till summer. <laughs> so yeah. right, right. Yeah. I just thought I'd put it out there because I think it might be supported by the council. Okay. Thanks for that. Thank you. Good to know. Anything else before we vote on this? Okay. I'm I'm not seeing any, so um We'll do a roll call vote on this. So um, all those in favor of reducing the FY21 uh, general fund operating budget by the amount listed, say aye. Councilor Bottomley, would you take a roll? Sure, I will vote uh, yes. Councilor Jasorger? Yes. Councilor Elmer? Yes. Councilor Forgey? Yes. Councilor Wheeler? I vote yes. Thank you, everyone. That passes unanimously. Um, we have a balanced budget. Um, so we'll move now to page 25 in the packet. Um, I move that it be ordered that the City Council authorizes increasing fund 1585, ambulance revolving fund, spending limit 40,000 for a revised spending limit of $120,000 for the fiscal year 2021 in accordance with Mass General Law Chapter 44, Section 53E and one half. Receipts received but not expended in FY 2021 shall be carried over to FY 2022. No further appropriation shall be made in excess of the balance of the fund, nor shall the total expenditures for the fiscal year exceed the annual spending limit of $120,000. Is there a second? Second, 4G. All right, we have a second. Um, is there discussion? I might um, start things off by asking Director Gilman to uh, just give a brief summary of this. Chief Strand spoke to it a moment ago. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, he did, um, in order to make some of the adjustments to his budget, he needed to have an increase in the ambulance revolving. He also spoke to the fact that the revenue is also coming in higher in, in the ambulance revolving to, to cover this. Um, so this sort of, this goes hand in hand with the fire budget cuts. Right, thank you. So, so it, uh, <laughs> we don't want, we probably don't want to make one without the other. Right. Um, <laughs> You know, it's obviously <laughs> this body's purview, but that, that would be my take. I'd agree. So it's, uh, you know, increasing it from 80 to 120. Any questions or comments, discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, um, raise your hand and say aye. 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 That's five. It passes unanimously. Moving on, we have a similar order on page 27. 
I move that it be ordered that the sum of $32,423 be transferred from 1627 bond premium for fiber and build out equipment for the GSET Enterprise Fund. Second. Is there a, okay. Seconded by Councillor DeSorger. Is there discussion? Um, I have a question. Yes, Councillor DeSorger. Um, can you tell us in that 1627 bond fund and where that came from? Director Gilman, please. So we had this preliminary discussion when we were talking about the fire station. I don't know if you recall this or not, but each time the city bonds um, or issues a, a ban, there's a potential to receive what's known as bond premium. Um, those that are generated from bonds issued for an enterprise fund need to stay and be utilized by the enterprise fund. So GSET has over $5 million out in bands that has generated this premium. And so therefore it needs to be used on capital, which is a, a requirement of, of bond premium. Um, and so GSET has been utilizing this to expand the network or to run fiber. I'll follow up if I may. Yes. So go what, ahead. What would be left in that fund? For for GSET's portion, uh, six thousand. That's just GSET's portion. There's more bond premium for sewer and water and gen general fund, which we're voting or submitted a financial order for. Um, the fire station. Okay. Any uh, any more questions or discussion? Um, okay. Seeing none, I know uh, Director Lunt will make good use of this. He's uh, he's asked me, I think already, um, when you know how soon uh, he could get his grubby paws on it. No, I'm just kidding. Um, all right, so seeing no further discussion, all those in favor of uh, transferring the funds, um, uh, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed, abstain, passes unanimously. Okay, and this is the, uh, the last of the appropriation orders is on page 29. I move that it be ordered that the sum of $42,900 be appropriated from the General Stabilization Fund for the appraisal of right-of-ways along Wisdom Way. Is there a second? I'll second, 4G. Seconded by Councillor 4G. And we'll open it up for discussion um, by, uh, I'll ask uh, Director Warner, would you be so kind as to um, just give us a brief introduction for this one? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so the Wisdom Way, um, we've been working on this project with uh, the, the the TPO uh, Transportation uh, Organization. Um, it's going into almost two and a half, three years for the process. Um, the short story is we provide the engineering appraisals. Um, temp acquisitions and permanent acquisitions if, if uh, an example the, the road needs to be moved so um, this it's it's a long process but it's a great deal for the city um, I believe we're uh, we've appropriated two hundred eighty four thousand dollars for this project uh, and right now it's programmed for three point seven million um, so we're, we're standing on third base uh, headed headed for home plate excuse the baseball analogy on this um, so we need to get professional appraisals done. I think there's 14 properties or lots parcels going up Wisdom Way. Uh, some will be permanent easements we need to shift the road away from the, the wall that, that's crumbling and, and the one we're going to replace it with. Uh, some are temporary. So this, this, uh, this request for appropriation is for us to get the professional appraisals done. Uh, and then we'll go into negotiating uh, acquisition uh, the acquisition process. So um, 
I put this in, I, it, it's pretty timely. Um, the, the project got moved up four years. I think I spoke to the council about that. And they're, they're looking to get this thing out to bid late summer, early fall at the latest. So, um, you know, we, we need to finish this last piece in order to, to bring this project to, to the city. So that's kind of an overview. Thanks. Um, yeah, and just speaking as uh, Precinct 7 counselor, there was a lot of uh, concern from residents uh, there around uh, the, the hill and the curve going up Wisdom Way towards the fairgrounds. Um, people tend to drive on the other side of the road for a, for a bit. So not only is there a potential danger from the condition of the um, retaining wall, but there's, there's the potential danger of people um, you know, crossing lanes. So um, the residents that I've talked to have been excited and glad to hear, and I'm certainly glad to hear that this project has been moved up. Um, it also includes a pedestrian way from, um, I, I believe, River Street to the, um, to the fairgrounds, which I think would be great for um, especially when the fair is happening and, and you, you get people, there's, you know, a parking crunch or maybe folks want to save on parking and they end up walking up that hill. And right now it's in terrible condition, um, but hopefully it'll be, it'll be much nicer. And I'm sure that's could may or may not be part of the reason for the need um, for some of the easements. Any questions or comments from counselors? Okay. Well, seeing none, um, thank you, Director Warner. We will You're take welcome. a vote. All those in favor of the appropriation, um, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? It passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have nothing listed for discussion, um, but we do have uh, some new business. And uh, that was a request for reports um, on revenues and expenditures, um, quarterly reports. Um, and I believe that, that those actually do, we are actually already receiving quarterly reports. And Director Gilman was so kind as, as to uh, uh, send send uh, one out and you know I think um, that they obviously there's sometimes a delay they don't have, you know get sent out on the same day every every quarter um, but I do think we tend to get them in a timely fashion and um, I think it's a good reminder for all of us to to take a look at them because certainly we get a lot of emails uh, into our council folders and it's tough to keep up on things um, but maybe it's a good reminder to have a little, um, you know, quick discussion whenever the quarterly reports come through. Um, so, uh, Councilor Forgey, did you have anything um, further to add on that? Um, no, but I think it's very, my, the, the reason I did it was to make sure that we all knew where we stood as we go through the budget, as we see some of the cuts that are being made, and also to be prepared for what's going to come next fiscal year as well. So I think that's very helpful to all of us. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Um, all right. We have no uh, other business listed. Um, is there anything that any counselors uh, would like to bring up? I know it's already quarter after seven. So uh, seeing none, um, I will read the first reading. Um, appropriate $6 million for the construction. City Council first reading. Appropriate $6 million for the construction of a new fire station. Um, that's it for us. Our next meeting is scheduled for December 15th at 5.30 p.m. via WebEx. 
I'll hear a motion to adjourn. So moved. Moved by Councillor Elmer. Is there a second? Second, 4G. Seconded by Councillor 4G. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, abstain. <laughs> <laughs> this meeting is adjourned at 7.14 p.m. Thanks, everyone. Thank yeah, you. thank you, folks, Bye -bye. for a good meeting. Thank you. Bye.